Um, and with that, I'm going to go on mute and turn this over to Laura and Gabe. Thank you both so much uh, for presenting with us today. Thanks, Preston. Um, so really excited about the content partnership we're starting and this pod or this webinar on podcasting is the first uh, of that. So um, it should be great. And I'm very excited about being able to share a lot of content about drafting contracts, negotiating contracts and everything in between. But today we're here to talk about how to negotiate a podcast agreement. And with us, we have Gabe Meister, one of the best media and content licensing and transactional lawyers, uh, I think, uh, anywhere. And so I want to uh, go ahead and introduce, have Gabe introduce himself, and uh, then we can dive right in. Oh, thank you, Laura. Thank you for the kind words, too. Um, it's great to be joining you on your inaugural episode, seriously. Um, <laughs> So just a little bit about me for a couple of seconds. I, I've been doing this for about 22 years. I started back at Morrison and Forster as a summer associate in 1998. And then I was at MoFo for 16 years in New York and Tokyo in their technology transactions group. Um, when I left MoFo, I went to join the National Basketball Association, the NBA, in-house as their um, vice president and senior media counsel. So I was responsible for North American uh, licensing and media deals. And then I went to Epix, the premium cable channel for about a year to be SVP business and legal affairs there, working on a lot of similar things in the media technology space. Um, I started my firm, the law office of Gabe Meister in 2019 to uh, provide you know, speedy and cost-effective guidance on media and tech transactions, and that's what I'm doing now. Uh, my background is I went to, I was a biology major at Brown, um, and I got my JD at Harvard, and back, at, just a, a little note between Brown and Harvard, I worked in the TB HIV research lab there, so I was doing immunology research. So my path has been a long and winding one, and yet here I am. So thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, and so why don't we get started? Uh, Gabe's going to start with uh, his, some slides to provide an overview view and background on podcasting mm -hmm. agreements and relationships mm -hmm. to really set the stage just to review a contract, a podcasting related contract after going through these slides. Yeah, so sure, let's start with the slides. And, and what I did at the beginning is I tried to put together um, an overview of what different kinds of relationships are involved in creating and distributing a podcast. Because when you, when you step back and you say, what is a podcasting agreement? There are so many different kinds of agreements that are required in order to even create a podcast, let alone get it out there, get advertisers, get sponsors, and leverage that for revenue and to inform people, et cetera. So let's start right in the middle here. This little hexagon you see is there are X number of creators of the podcast. And people get together and say, hey, let's do a podcast about, um, you know, being raised uh, on old television shows and all our favorite TV shows. And it's the three of us and we all know about this stuff. It would be great to get in front of a microphone and do it. So at the very first step is going to be some kinds of agreements between those creators to to establish the relationship. Are they going to be, is it going to be a partnership? Are they going to have some sort of corporate entity that they run it through? Are they just going to have a loose kind of informal relationship where they collectively sign every agreement? Um, that's what these little arrows are that you see between the little dots there. The dots are the people who are the creators. So there are already agreements and contracts involved in, in establishing those relationships. So let's then, so they've gotten together, they know what the podcast is gonna be. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, well, what are the inputs for the podcast? It's not just people sitting around talking, although that's a big part of it. A podcast doesn't just create itself. You don't just hit record on your iPhone and then push that to some server somewhere and then everybody all of a sudden is listening to your podcast. You might need agreements between the creators and a producer. Someone's going to help them do all of the production work for the podcast. That could include an audio engineer to do the audio engineering work and do the sound and editing of the, of the episodes. Um, so there are gonna be agreements between these podcast creators, whatever entity they have, and these folks. Maybe there'll be employment agreements if it's going to be, uh, if they're gonna employ them, maybe there'll be independent contractor agreements, probably more likely. So you get a lot of interesting issues in those types of agreements. Um, 
you have to you have to arrange for your space and for your equipment. Some people will buy all of their equipment and have it in house and have their own space, but more often than not, you're going to want to go into a more professional setting where you can use somebody's space and equipment and software, and there will be an agreement around that course, right? How do you know, how do you pay for it? When, when are you scheduled to do it? Uh, does it line up with the schedule that of uh, the podcast you're, you're trying to create? Who gets the insurance? All sorts of issues there. That's kind of the, the more grungy kind of technical side of putting it together. Then you've got the blue lines here, which are pointing at the, at the creatives, right? Who's writing? Is there, are there scripts involved for the show? Are there going to be show notes? Uh, show notes being when you go on your chosen podcast app and you look below the episode and you see notes about things that they discussed in the show, interesting links, um, whatever those might be, those notes have to be written by somebody. So who's writing them and how do the parties deal with ownership of those things and, and licensing and then actually just engaging the person to do so? Who designed uh, the logo for the podcast, right? The logo for your podcast is going to be something that you're going to want to throw up on Instagram, on Facebook. It's going to be appearing in the podcast directories. It's a piece of artwork. It's a copyrightable work. And there may be trademark involved too, if you're going to use that as a mark to designate the source of your podcast. So who's creating that? That's, there's some artist there that's creating it for you. How do you uh, make sure you have the appropriate rights in those, in those creative pieces? What kind of music, if any, are you going to use in your podcast? Are you going to use um, third-party music that already exists? Are you going to have uh, people come in and create music for you? Are you going to go on Twitter and somebody created a cool bumper music for your podcast and say, hey, can I use that? There are all kinds of agreements between all the creative people with these blue lines and the podcast creators to make sure that they have the appropriate rights to use those materials going forward. So now let's go a little bit further and let's look at the orange lines at the bottom. The creators themselves may be the hosts, but there may be other hosts that they're working with. Maybe the creators say, you know who will be the best host for this podcast? It will be so-and-so from so-and-so television show. Everybody recognizes their voice. Um, it's going to be fantastic. We're going to get a lot of a big uptick in subscriptions if, if, if we do that. So there's going to be some kind of agreement. A sort of a more entertainment side agreement between the host and the podcast creators to, again, get the appropriate rights from the host and make sure any kind of compensation is worked out. So there's another agreement they have to put in place. And then if you're working on a podcast that has guests, which so many of them do, what's your relationship between you as the creators and the guest? Um, I always advise having some kind of quote unquote release and I say quote unquote release because a release is just a part of the document that you want to have signed with your guests, but where the guests are acknowledging that they're coming on your show, they're talking, they're making comments about things, and you want them to be responsible for the things that they're going to say because there are plenty of issues that can come up from what guests say, just like what the hosts say. And you also want to make sure you have the appropriate rights to use their name and likeness and biographical information that they provide you to throw up in the show notes to talk about, et cetera. Because you don't want a guest to come back later and say, I don't like the way you said the thing you said about the thing I said, and I want to edit the show, and I don't like the picture. So there are all these kind of, that's another set of agreements. Um, a little bit more standardized, but you know, it's really important to have in place. So let's now get to the other side of the technical equation. On these, these I don't know, peach colored lines, are pointing from the podcast cast creators to the hosting provider and the directories. So what's the difference here? It's now sometimes these entities are the same. And by the way, for any of these lines, there are many times when the same entity is doing two different things. For example, the, the, the place that's renting you, your space and equipment, might have an in-house audio engineer. And part of the deal is that they're going to be editing the episodes and cutting them in length and doing the kind of post-production sound work. So those two lines collapse into a single agreement, which starts to make these agreements, in my view, is really interesting to deal with. Right, the, the kind of conflation of these roles. So the hosting provider is the actual entity that is running the servers or contracting out for the servers that are going to store and serve your episode. Podcast episodes, I don't know if you ever had a storage issue with your iPhone or Android device, and you go in, you're like, why am I, why is my device so full of hundreds of megs of these files? And often it's because you've downloaded 13 episodes of a podcast that you never listen to anymore. And that's when you realize how large these episodes are. They're enormous, high quality audio files. 
Um, podcasts get streamed, but they often also get downloaded to your device. That's why you'll often hear about a statistic for podcast metrics being how many downloads were there. So the hosting provider has to store these things, serve them up on demand, and that's a, it's a, it's a um, data intensive kind of thing. So are you going to be contracting with Anchor FM to host your, host your materials or some other hosting provider? That's a contract. That's a kind of service agreement with service levels, technical requirements, and all sorts of stuff, allocations of risk and responsibility. That's a, yet another agreement for podcasters to deal with. And then there are the directories. So the directories, I call them directories. I'm not sure if that's the best word for them, but that's the way I think of them. Um, they are the place where your podcast is listed for public consumption. So as I understand it, what will happen is you'll have your hosting provider over here and the hosting provider, you'll create an RSS feed and that RSS, you give to the directory like Apple and Apple takes in that information and then makes your show visible in the podcasts app, just like Google would do in, I think they're reskinning the Google play podcast platform, but just like Google would do in the podcast app there, or like what's coming, what seems to be coming up with Amazon where they're going to be having podcasts on audible. Th there's a directory that lists your podcasts where users of those services can access them. What does that do? It, it helps you distribute a podcast. It really gets you out there. You want to be on all these platforms. Some are proprietary. Uh, some are, let's put it differently. Some are more closed than others. Um, some have more of a premium side to them, like Stitcher. They may have a basic level and a premium level. So where you're placed in those directories is important too. Sometimes the hosting provider and the directory provider are the same, but not always. And you'll start to see issues like that come up in podcast network agreements, which we'll be talking about. And the final part of the slide is this stuff down here, down here in the bottom right corner. So how are you going to make revenue from your podcast? Well, maybe if you're extremely well known already and you're going to be doing podcasts, you're getting paid to create the episodes so that you can provide content for platforms. But more often than not, I would say you are creating the episodes on your own time and money and potentially gaining revenue through advertising. You may say, uh, oh, well, I'm, I have three spots during the show and I wanna advertise this specific kind of chocolate that I really like. And the advertiser will give you ad copy and pay you for, they'll give you a CPM, you know, cost per thousand of downloads. They'll say, if a thousand people download your episode, you get 25 bucks or 50 bucks, or whatever the going rate for CPMs is, depending on who you are and who the advertiser is. There may be sponsors who want to do different kinds of relationships with you that are not just advertising, but it's more that they're a sponsor of the show, kind of the way in the 50s you'd have the sponsor of a show at the beginning of the show. Um, those are the kind of advertising and sponsorship relationships. Sometimes those are directly between the podcasters and the advertisements and sponsors. Other times it might be handled by some of these other entities. There may be... Um, a uh, provider of some service that has relationships with a sponsor. And we start talking about yet another contract there. And on the flip side, how are you marketing and promoting your podcast? It's not just being in a directory, but maybe you want some kind of relationship where you get cross promotion in someone else's podcast. So you could do a deal with another podcast, say, okay, each one of us mentioned the other podcast once in once a week for 30 seconds. And we'll do, we'll have some kind of agreement around there. And then finally, I'm going to get to this one. And this is the one I want to talk about today. So I'm going to kind of highlight it. And Laura and I will be going through one of these agreements. This is the podcast network agreement. These are, to me, kind of the most interesting agreements in this bunch. Because I think you're all familiar with podcast networks, or at least uh, many of us who, I, I listen to podcasts religiously. I'm always walking to and from the office, to and from school with my kids. And I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I, I hear um, this, this podcast is part of the Stitcher network, or this is part of Earwolf, or this is part of Gimlet Media. Um, there are many well-known podcast networks that are out there, and they sort of serve as aggregators of podcasts under a banner. And in my mind, the banner kind of indicates the quality of the, of the podcast. It's sort of like, a, it's, it's like an extra layer of branding on top. Um, that that tells you like oh you're getting you know you're getting a gimlet podcast and that's the kind of content that you like but it's not just this free relationship there's a there's a commercial relationship between the creator and the podcast network so the podcast network might help you do some of these other things here they might help with hosting they might help put you up on directories they may even provide 
um, production equipment or pay some of the cost to produce your podcast in return often for the right to sell advertising and promotion within your podcast. So maybe the stuff down at the, at the bottom left here that we were looking at before, a bottom right, advertisers and sponsors, that could be popped into the podcast network relationship and they could have control over the advertising and sponsorship. And maybe they'll handle cross promotion for you. And in return, you're also going to agree to brand your podcast as part of that network. It's sort of like you're seen as part of the talent of that podcast, podcast network. So I'd like to focus on that. And I think, you know, Laura and I have talked about this a little before. Let, let's try to look at a podcast network agreement and see what we can find, because a lot of us are here for, for drafting tips and advice. So it's always great to look at the actual language. Sorry, Laura, you're on mute. Just give Laura one second. And while Laura's unmuting, um, you're going to see uh, there are many common commercial and legal issues across all of these kinds of contracts. But when you're dealing with a, a podcast network contract or a podcast, sometimes you'll see them called co podcast production contracts. The name is essentially irrelevant. You can figure out what it is from the, from reading the contract and see what the nature of the relationship is. Um, you know, you'll see a handful of these core commercial and legal issues pop up over and over again. Laura, are you back on with audio? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yep. perfect. Sorry about that. I'm having issues. Yeah, no, I think that's a great overview of so many key issues and making sure that we all understand the same uh, landscape that we're talking about. Because ultimately, as you and I have talked a lot about, contracts are stories. Contracts show the relationship with, between all the parties. And all these different um, entities are really characters in the story. And so one particular contract essentially tells a story of these particular parties and what they're doing together and their relationship as part of that bigger story. So I really love the, the graphic that you created. It, it really told the story well. Thank you. And it took, it took a while to create it. And I'll, I'll, you don't, it's something that you and I talked about before is sometimes you, when you're doing this, you really need to take a step backward and get the bigger mm -hmm. picture of things. And it took me a while to actually tease out all of the different kinds of relationships. And the purpose wasn't to scare people and think, oh, I'm going to do a podcast, but it looks, uh, but Gabe and Laura said I have to do these 17 different kinds of agreements. Like, it's not like that. <laughs> it's more just to be aware of, um, it's like in a Shakespeare play when they'll give you the list of characters at the beginning. It gives you a sense of mm -hmm. what the story is going to be about. Um, and yeah. it helps you, it helps you make, it helps you make better decisions to know who the possible players are here. So. For sure, um, for sure, because each of the parts, you know, and we're going to get to some of the commercial and legal issues that we talk about in, in mm -hmm. these kinds of relationships. And so that's our next section of this. And I think, Gabe, you're really kind of talking, highlighting at a high level before we get to the contract, some of the big picture issues to watch for in the any kind of contract relating to content and content distribution. Yeah, absolutely. And this is this slide. Um, is really just here to show you, give you a kind of a sampler of core com commercial and legal issues. This is by no means and not even close to exhaustive, but these are some issues that come up commonly, especially when you're working between a, a podcaster and a podcast network or somebody who's handed kind of the, these multiple responsibilities on the podcast network side. You know, the, the first issue is often, and we'll go over these in a little bit more detail, is what is the content requirement? In other, in other kinds of work I've done, it's like, what the, what's the content clause? What is it that you're actually being tasked to create? Um, it's not just what it is, but how do I deliver it? How do I get it to wherever it needs to be? And how many episodes and over what time period? I mean, you are, it, in a way, it's helpful to look at yourself as a service provider. If you're creating content, you're not just a content creator, you're a service provider. Uh, you're being contracted to create X episodes over Y months and deliver them within Z days, you know, whatever, whatever the schedule is, that kind of puts you in the contractor mode. So it requires you to think a little bit 
differently, which is which I find make it interesting. And always also, can you maintain creative control over your podcast? It's easy to just think that that's a no brainer. Of course you can because you're the creator. But when you start to look through the contracts and you see what rights the other side might have, you start to think, well, you know, do I actually have absolute creative control or can I, or am I going to be told to tell certain advertisements that I'm not really interested in advertising? Or am I going to be told one day that, you know, I know you wanted to do this episode, but we'd really like you to do an episode on X, Y, and Z. So um, licensing and intellectual property is, is always, you know, my, one of my favorite parts, but the core of this is you know, who owns, who owns what, who, and this is as between the creatives on that left side of the diagram, the artists and the musicians and the, the script writers and the audio engineer who owns what, and then you in the middle, and then the podcast network or the, the hosting provider even, or whoever's helping you on that right side, who owns what, and what are the scopes of the various licenses that are floating around? One common question we got, and I think this was a question that was um, submitted beforehand, was, was can, can, how can you repurpose your episodes for other platforms? You know, it's easy to just say, well, of course I can use my stuff, I own it. But if, if your license to someone is exclusive, you know, your ownership could be irrelevant for what you want to do. Um, liability and indemnification, you know, this is Laura and I, you and I deal with this in many different contexts and, you know, everything is just a balance of risks and responsibilities. But at its core, it's who's responsible if something goes wrong. And you can think of the parade of horribles that any lawyer can create, but there are some pretty easy ones to think of when it comes to podcasts. What if there's, you know, IP infringement, or if there is a defamation claim, or if uh, somebody claims, there's IP infringement, or somebody claims you use their music in an author unauthorized manner, or put up something that someone else put up on Twitter in your show notes, and you didn't credit them, or you did credit them. I mean, there are issues here, and the person who is aggrieved isn't necessarily just going to sue or complain to one party. They may go after the party with the deepest pockets. They may go after everybody involved in that whole ecosystem because, you know, they can, they can, nothing prevents you from suing someone. Um, right, right. And revenue is always important. When I, like I said earlier, if you're, if you're really well known, maybe you're actually making money to create the podcast. So it's more of an entertainment type relationship where you're being, you know, you're, you're creating content for somebody and they're paying you to create the content. But if it's not like that, there's still going to be revenue from various sources, ad revenue, sponsorship revenue, maybe revenue from syndicating, right? Depending on what the rights are. So maybe there's merchandise and, and that you're creating, or maybe the network's creating it for you. Maybe it's co-branded, all kinds of issues around how revenue is going to be shared. Um, that's always, that's a pretty, it's an interesting to get into the weeds with those. And, and termination, I was thinking more about this today. You know, every agreement has some term, even if the term is perpetual, <laughs> that's the term. Um, how long is the relationship going to last? Are the parties, do the parties know each other so well that they're less concerned about the length of the relationship? Um, are they happy with a longer term because they know they're gonna work together well? Are the parties super tentative and parties each want a termination for convenience after 90 days because a better opportunity might come by? Uh, you know, all these issues have to be addressed um, in, unless it's, of course, to your advantage to remain silent, and then we can talk about that more too. But one common thing people don't think about after termination is, are you going to have access to your materials after termination? If you're not using, if the podcast network isn't hosting your materials, that might not be an issue because you'll have access to them through the hosting provider. But if they're doing a bunch of stuff for you, which means they're in control of the files, how do you know you're going to be able to get those back after termination to the extent you have rights to use them? So there are all these, like, these are really basic things and just went into a little bit of filigree there about some of the aspects of the issues, but we'll see them come up in, in what we're doing now. Great. Mm -hmm. So now I think Gabe, you're going to start going through, or we're going to start going through this podcast network agreement. Sure. And the goal is, to really focus, I think, but Gabe, we're going to hit on each of the sections as we flip through. So these are the some of these main parts, mm -hmm. and the discussion will really focus in on some of the key provisions. Yep. 
So this is, um, this is, it was called a podcast production agreement, but I view it as a podcast network agreement, even though, interestingly, the word podcast network is only mentioned once in the agreement. We'll get to that. Um, <laughs> you can see at the bottom, this is, this was something that I found on Law Insider. There's the source link at the bottom, so you can, you can go there and, and access that document. Um, it was an interesting example of a different kind of approach to a podcast agreement. Um, and here's a sort of bird's eye view. Uh, by the way, this this preparing these slides really tested my the limits of my technical acuity because I had to use a bunch of apps, including MS Paint, my my very favorite app, to create these slides where I could show you. This is exactly what I mean by stepping back. Step back, look at the agreement as a whole, read it with fresh eyes, and see what the what kind of chunks of stuff are in here that tell the story. Um, so, Laura, you and see. And Gabe, yeah. I'll ask you. Um, can you remind us, I know we looked at the slide a few minutes ago, but what is, what, who are the parties on this agreement and within so the, that sure. you know, world of characters that you talked about? So the parties, and this goes back to that one slide where I tried to isolate it. It's that hexagon that was in the middle, that is the podcasters or the people who are creating the podcast, right? It could be mm -hmm. a partnership, it could be a corporation, whatever that entity is, and a podcast network. Right, they're just two entities, but those two entities have a variety of functions in this agreement, right, and take care of a variety of responsibilities. But this is just one agreement; it's just those two entities. Okay, and and yeah. the idea is that the podcasters, the metal hexagon, have already contracted behind the scenes with some of the other creatives yes. um, yep. behind. Them. Yep, absolutely, okay. because they're. Okay. Because there's, um, so you'll see, we go, just look at a very high level again. Um, I, in, I enhance the headers to make them a little bit more visible from this high. So you see in section two, there's a podcast schedule, which says, when right. podcaster are you going to deliver these episodes? How often? How, you know, and you'll even see in section three over here that there's a fee assessment for late or missed episodes, right? Why would that, why mm -hmm. would there be something like that? Well, because the network is relying on the podcaster to create content and the network needs an episode a week from everybody in the network to keep the network going, right? To keep fresh content flowing. So there, there's, you know, that's about the kind of core creative stuff. Um, section four is about the content liability. It's really more of just an indemnity. There's a rep and warranty later in section 13, but about the parties trying to allocate responsibility for bad things that might happen. Um, mm -hmm. Section five, we get back to the content obligations. We'll dig a little deeper into these. This is about what is it exactly that you have to provide? You have to provide a logo. You have to provide these certain files. We, the network in 5B, can give you promotional materials that you have to say during your podcast. That's the sort of advertising component. Um, so you can see where creative control becomes kind of an issue. If you go down to section six over here on the, this is the top right corner, cost of services to artists, compensation of artists, income and expenses. This agreement dealt with those issues in a very general way and sort of punted the whole question of, well, there may be syndication opportunities and revenue opportunities and we'll use some effort to bring those to you and you may be able to participate in those. And meanwhile, we're not going to charge you for services. You're going to you're going to be responsible for your own costs and creating things. So we'll we'll dig into that a little bit again. All of the IP is, stuff. Is that going to yeah. get? Is is the syndication going to be covered as as we go through the agreement, or is that something I think, that? I think where we'll cover it is where we'll cover the syndication is when we talk about the IP. That's in sections ten and eleven. Again, this agreement took a okay. little bit of an unusual tack on on IP. But the question, you know, it, and this is another thing you and I discussed, what's so really important in agreements like this is taking a step back and figuring out what's missing. Because a clever drafter on the other side, or even a drafter who's not, is, is careless, it depends. You're right? <laughs> clever and careless can look like, they can have the same result um, when you're looking at the agreement. But often if, Missing a concept itself has consequences. So by looking at a variety of these and being having access to a variety of these kind of forms and just digging around on the internet for them, you start to build up a, a sense of what needs to be included. And you get that great aha moment when you realize, oh, they didn't mention so and so and they didn't mention it because they knew that if they mentioned it, it would be bad for them. So you, you know, you really need those kind of things, like including like syndication. That's a thing where you need to need to spell it out. So we'll get to that in the IP in 10 and 11. 
You see section 13, right. which is the, the reps, that's more about the um, allocation of risk. And then termination is all addressed in sections 14 through 16. Breach, termination, is there a termination for convenience, right? When does it happen? Um, so this is like, you know, it's a, it's a little disjointed story, but it's a story. It's a story about the relationship, like you said, Laura. Right. Um, well, let's get in. I know yeah. I saw a couple of comments that people couldn't read it, and that's because that those slides were uh, an yes. overview, just to give a basic picture before we're yeah. diving in. So right. maybe there we'll start will, diving into the individual ones. There will not be an exam on the bird's eye view of sample agreement slide because that was <laughs> it was literally to like blur your eyes and and look at the headings and see the story. So let's get into some. Yeah. Let's get into our our bread and butter, which is what we love to do all day, which is draft and think. Yep. So here's an example of a, of a content requirement. This is section five of the agreement and we talks about what materials the podcaster needs to produce and provide to the podcast network. And, and so in 5A, you can see that it says- Let's for yeah. you, sure. um, just to introduce the two different, um, two yeah. different views that you've presented. Yeah. The the left side is the original that you got, and the right yeah. side is some ideas of your first markup. Yep, and I did a quick and very quick and dirty markup. Um, the hat that I was wearing doing the markup was, okay, I know what my client wants, but I don't know the answers to a lot of these questions. I'd rather include some notes to the other side, which is where it says note with a colon, and then internal notes to my client saying, what do you want to do here? Giving them some recommendations, but also you'll see my favorite phrase, let's discuss, which is we need to talk about this because I need, it's not going to be convenient for me to give you a menu of all the options in, in track changes and you to choose one. And for, for reference, artist, even though it's a singular term, it sounds like an individual, it's, it's the entity that is creating the podcast, whether it's a person or a group of people. And company is the podcast network here. So that should frame things. Okay. So a little, I like to think of left as before and after, thinking from mm -hmm. as me representing the, the artist. So if you look, so 5A, 5B, 5C. 5A is really basic stuff, right? And you can't, as, a, as the lawyer, unless you're in-house and so you know exactly how the client's business works, you're not necessarily going to be able to know whether the you know this 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 number of pixels in a jpeg is going to work for them or whether they're going to do an intro and outro for every episode so these are things you're going to talk with your client about um if you go down into section 5b this is a, a bit of an interesting situation so they say this is again this is the only time the term podcast network was mentioned in the agreement but it is really the defining characteristic of what the agreement is so they say, as a condition of being a member of the podcast network, artist agrees to record certain material in every episode of the podcast, referred to as network promotion as part of advertising. So the first question this raises is, you know, in, in my mind is, what does being a member of the podcast network mean? Because there's nowhere in the agreement that they describe what benefits we get from being the network. There's not a cross promotion obligation. They're not paying us to be part of the network. Nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if and you see, yeah. In a way, it's a, I was going to say, it's in contrast, sometimes you see subject to compliance with the agreement, here are some rights you have. Um, right. So it's right. phrased that way, but it's, in a sense, it's a meaningless phrase because there's nothing behind it. Right. But, it, you know, the conditionality sticks out like a sore thumb. You're like, well, I, I don't, so I have to do this in order to get that, but I don't know what the that is, <laughs> but I know that I have to do this. I mean, I guess hypothetically, you yeah. could say, oh, I don't, I don't mind being part of the network, so I'm not going to do this part, but that's not really how things work. Um, yeah. so what they're and what they're telling you is they're going to give you, quote unquote, certain material in every episode. Well, what is it? Are these promotions that are going to mm -hmm. be different from, from, for every episode? Is it going to be, you're going to want me to do an advertisement for cigarettes in front of my children's podcast? Like, what, what exactly are you <laughs> telling me to include? Um, and that's why I added here at the end where I said, note, please describe in detail. I added, provided that any network promotion will be subject to artist, artist prior, prior written approval. Just to put some line in there now to say, we only have to say things that we've approved, right? And, and that at least gets the conversation going. 
sometimes a draconian phrase like that, which is very absolute, like, oh, it has to be our prior approval, sole discretion, yada, yada. It's more of a way to get the conversation going. It's like, you've asked me to say a thing and you're not going to tell me what it is till the day of. I'm like, okay, I promise that I'll say it as long as I approve of it. And that like sets, the, right. sets up the negotiation. Um, yeah. they, t they tell you in that same paragraph, guidelines for the network promotion will be provided by company, period. Okay, it's like, well, if you have guidelines, attach the guidelines, put them on a schedule, right? We're not going to follow guidelines that we don't see now. <laughs> um, and then recording of the network promotion, the, the final line of Section 5B, where any recording is subject to approval by company of, the, of those promotion materials before it can be proof of public mm -hmm. consumption. Stepping back in the relationship, there are rights in, in here for them to penalize us for getting episodes in late, for having episodes that are too short. So they can't have that right on the one hand, and then on the other hand say that they get to approve all of this stuff without any, without any parameters around that, right? You have to mm -hmm. say, I would say, okay, well then if you don't approve it within five days, it's deemed approved, or you will only do that reasonably. But things like that to try to smooth the process along so that there aren't, aren't ways for them to to kind of our gotchas for us. So, right. Um, and I noted to the client at the end of 5B here, it's interesting how they're not prohibiting us from running our own ads, keeping the revenue, et cetera, better to remain silent. I probably wouldn't couch it this way in, a, in real life to them in the comment. I would explain it, so explain it to them. But there is nothing in here that explicitly prohibits the artist from including its own ads, which I think is fantastic. Right, so that's a, that's the kind of thing that right. is not said, but could be to your advantage. So always the question is, do you want to raise it or not? Right. So yeah. there's a and so, we talked yeah. about this before. I was saying, you know, when we talked about it before, a lot of our discussion was which provisions you, you know, revise and which you don't, and the mm -hmm. strategic tactical approach to it. And we pointed out some that are in there. You know, you want to identify what's not in there. But just mm -hmm. because something's not in there doesn't mean you put it in. It may right. be you want to move out because there's this tactical advantage. And I think that's what this point really brings home. Right. You'll, you'll often see a knee-jerk reaction when you, when you think something. You, you want to make sure you're okay doing something under a contract, but it doesn't say that you can't. So you'll have a knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. of, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, I'm specifically <laughs> permitted to do so. And all you're doing is putting a giant flashing light on the issue for the other side to say, you know, we didn't really think about that. Let's just change that to not permitted to do so. You know, and then you have to have an argument about something that you could have, um, you know, that you could have elided a little bit. So, yeah. Um, and that goes back to that picture that is you know, the same theme that you're talking about, the picture of what rights do we already have? What rights are we giving away? What restrictions right. do we have? Right. You know, and operating within a little bubble of freedom that isn't restricted and mm -hmm. is within our purview. Yep. And that comes up in a lot in the kind of syndication question because it's often not addressed or it'll be addressed slyly mm -hmm. by the by ownership or use of exclusivity. But um, and just one more comment on this 5C down here. It's a, it's a little kind of thing that you'll see all, all the time. The goal of 5C is network is telling the artist the episodes have to be between X and Y minutes long. And company will try to edit it down if it's longer than an hour. But then it said, if they can't, if it's not reasonably possible, the recording will be rejected, period. Like, yeah. okay. So, you know, and in reality, there's this, always a the gap between what the contract says and how the parties actually act. And you hope that the contract's mm -hmm. in their drawer and the parties will work out in the relationship. But this is about leverage. If they have the right to reject something just because it's an, it's an hour and 15 minutes and they couldn't reasonably cut it down to an hour, how does that impact your being on schedule to deliver the right number of episodes? How does it impact, as you see later, their right to terminate for breach? So I like to try to neutralize mm -hmm. things like this and say, okay, if they can't reasonably do it, instead of rejecting, company will notify artists. No, my little email is sufficient because I don't want to get into get, uh, you know, a uh, certified letter from them. And the parties will cooperate <laughs> to edit the recording to bring it to an hour, right? It's just a simple yeah. thing that changes how the parties might deal with each other. So if somebody's looking at the contract and says, oh, it says here we have to cooperate. Okay, let's cooperate. Um, 
Um, no, I guess I, it's a, a fantastic point. Yeah, and it's it's the very final line here is my kicker because I just put it in here, which is this kind of creative control issue. The final version of each podcast mm -hmm. will be subject to artist review and approval before publication. In this agreement, the network is the one who's cutting the raw materials and turning them into final episodes, but we don't want mm -hmm. them to just create a thing. I think there's something like this in the movie Reality Bites, which I probably watched a hundred times back in the 90s, but where they edit something down and it's just, it is completely not the vision of the original artist or creator. Um, so mm -hmm. we don't want that to happen. So it's a, it's a recommendation for, for any kind of agreement yeah. like this. Can I flip forward to the IP section here? Of course. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> the way this agreement dressed IP, which to me is the, I, I think it's like the most important issue, it was a little bit unusual. If you look over on the before on the left, it says company will be sole owner and have perpetual use and control da, 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 of all unedited audio recordings produced under this agreement. And then it says all the things that they can do with them. They can use them, they can cut them, they can include them in masters, whatever. Mm -hmm. Section 11 says artist is the sole owner of all published audio recordings under the agreement. Published being the final edited version that the company provides as part of the services. It's weird because it's saying, okay, artists go and record a bunch of raw audio, give it to us, we'll own that, we'll be able to do whatever we want with it forever and ever. We'll create a final mm -hmm. episode and that alone will be your property that you can do with whatever you want with forever and ever. It's a very odd structure, but the first thing that sticks out at me is why is the network owning anything? Right? They haven't paid us to produce the podcast. We brought all the talent and other right. stuff to the table and, and stepping even further back. It's not that we care so much about ownership. It's ownership versus licensing because it's like a, my conceptual framework for this is we created it. We should own it. We're happy to give you extremely broad light, rights and let's talk about what those rights will be. But don't come with this weird structure right. about you own these things. And then I hear 10 years later that somebody in, in, in Norway has created a song using samples from my podcast because you licensed it from the raw audio. I mean, it, it's, right. it doesn't sound, it sounds a little bit crazy, but it, the bright, the ownership of the raw materials is so broad that it could give them the rights to do all mm -hmm. those things. So let's, uh, let's look right. at the after. Let's look at the after. And this is, um, strategically or stylistically, I tried, <laughs> it's always funny when you say to your client, look, or the other side, look, I tried to make, I tried to make as few changes as possible and they still look at it as a sea of <laughs> blue and red, you know, it's, it's, it's just the tension kind of never ends. But I really did try here to, 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 um, keep, to keep some other language around. So I went to section 11 yeah. and I said, let's talk about the ownership of the recordings. Okay. Artist is the owner of and has perpetual use and control of, let's just say all of it, the unedited stuff, the edited stuff, and the stuff that we provide mm -hmm. to you, which we would never give you ownership of anyway, but just to be clear, we own all that stuff. Okay. There is an ownership issue here. But the issue is we own those things, right? Um, but then I got back up to section 10 and I said, we're not just taking away this, the language of ownership, we're giving you a license. So the license is subject to and condition on your compliance network. We're granting you a license with all these yellow highlighted words to do the following mm -hmm. things, right? And you'll see, you know, I try to highlight some of the words that are, that are kind of key here. Um, we're giving you this scope, like the scope of licenses up here and the, the right. well, well, that's not better. The, the outside scope is here, the, the nature of the rights. And then the, what they can actually do is in A and B. So A says they can edit and create derivative works from the raw recordings, right? Of course they can do that because that's what they have to do to create the final episode. They're the ones creating the final episode. And notice how I said solely for purposes of creating the published recordings. And then in B, I'm giving them the core right that they need if they're the ones hosting this on their network is to distribute, transmit, perform, et cetera, the published recording solely through their podcast network. Because I want to force the point right. and say, what is the network? What are you doing with this stuff? Um, I'll, yeah. I'll craft the framework for the license. 
but you have to fill in some of the blanks, guys. You have to tell me what you're doing with this. And now I'm going to force the question of what is the network? So okay. that's how I, that was, and this is just one of an infinite number of strategies for dealing with something like this. Anybody could look at this and find probably 12 errors and 16 different ways to do it. <laughs> that's what's great about it's what we true. do. I got to admit, that's what, that's what makes me smile during the day when I'm not with my family. It's like, I'm, at least I'm doing things that are interesting like this. And, and it's very creative work. Um, yeah. if, you go, if you go to the yeah. before, I want to highlight the words you chose, the yes. edit and creative works, distribute, yeah. perform, display. One of the, the tips for people who don't work with licensing all the time is to remember to go back to your intellectual property statute and identify what rights your copyright statute, your patent statute, or whatever it is, those rights, those are the things that matter. So yes. Gabe didn't just do use your recording because yes. use is not a copyright term. Right. So maybe now, can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, it's, so if you look at the Copyright Act, the copyright, the owner of copyright in a work has, has a set of very specific rights that they can grant or not grant, right? The, the, it, nowhere in that, nowhere in that, in that list is the word use. Use is not a copyright right. It's, it's just a general term, which could be good or bad, depending on what side you're on, but it could also really get you into trouble mm -hmm. because it could be broader than what you want to grant. So I parse up, I parsed out the actual words and said, here's what, so edit creative derivative works, right? These are actual copyright language that we're talking about here. So or distribute, transmit, perform, and display, right? Often uh, somebody on the license, so, licensee side will put and otherwise exploit. What does that mean? It might not give them more in yeah. terms of copyright if you've already listed everything, but you know, you have to be careful of words like that. And no matter what words you use, I like this solely for purposes of language after the litany of the mm -hmm. right, because it says, even if I inadvertently gave you something broader than I, than I had to, you can still only do this for purposes of these limited purposes, right? Right. Um, and, and, and Gabe, just to keep us, I'm realizing we're, uh, to keep yeah. us on track, we've got about 12 minutes left, uh, it, including questions. So. Okay. So, but this is only, great. This has been yeah. fantastic. So the, the, in the second line of Section 10, I just want to point these out. These are, it's important to, to make sure your license is, that you have maintain control of things. I would say the word non-exclusive is the most important word in here. Because if you gave them an exclusive right to do this, Hypothetically, you're giving away the rights to syndicate your own stuff, to take a clip from your show uh, and put it on, on YouTube, to put your episode on YouTube. If it's a non-exclusive right, mm -hmm. then you have the right to exploit your show uh, in other ways outside of this network. If it's exclusive, then you're really tying yourself to this podcast network for a while, and, you're, and depending on how you deal with termination, et cetera, maybe forever with the episodes that you create for them. So as an example, if I have an episode about you know, TV shows and I want to have this one episode about this show from the 90s called Sliders that I used to watch in law school, um, I, and then there's somebody on YouTube who has a show that it's you know, the most comprehensive Sliders YouTube show in the world and they want to use a five minute clip, I wouldn't even be able to let them do that if I had granted an exclusive license. So, Got it. so let's, I'm going to run through a couple of these, the liability and indemnification. This is really a question of risk allocation. Who's going to be taking risks for bad things that happen? Now, the indemnity in here was very, it was, it was kind of ambiguous. So instead of going through and commenting and trying to make it what I want, sometimes I take this tack with clients, is I'm just going to put in a bunch of internal notes for my client and say, here are all the things that we need to discuss for this. Let's talk about it and restructure uh, let's restructure the provision to make it seem how you want. There, by the way, there was only a one-way indemnity, that is the artist indemnifying the network in here and nothing in, in return. Mm -hmm. So we, it's obviously something that needs to be addressed. Um, but one of the more important things in here is in the second line, um, in the first and second line. Is that where it is? Let's see. No, it's actually not. It's after the first internal note, there's a chunk, which is the indemnity. It says, we agree to hold them harmless, indemnify, et cetera. Indemnify, et cetera. I made sure that the indemnity only, only um, applied to third-party claims. And 
I made sure that we were only indemnifying for the content of the podcast as provided to company here under. Because if we're giving the company the control to change the podcast and do a cut of a final episode, why should we be in the position to take on the risk for that? We have no idea, unless we have approval rights, but if we don't have approval rights, which we may not, might not win in the negotiation, it's important for us to only indemnify, only take on risk for things over which we actually have the most control. So mm-hmm. that was, I don't even wanna to spend too much time on the indemnity, That's, it's a much more of a general issue, but you know, focusing it on the content of the podcast as opposed to the, the files or how it's used, et cetera, it's the content of the podcast and only as provided to the other side. So I think that's the the takeaway from this slide. Cool. Uh, Revenue down here, we can go through this. This is in sections seven, eight, nine. Um, This was a funny provision and it's worth talking about for a minute. Section seven, compensation of artists. Instead of promising a, a rev share for ads or merchandise, instead of promising any revenue, all the agreement said was artists will receive opportunities to share in revenue. For each source of revenue received by the company, they'll produce a separate revenue contract detailing the obligations of the artist to receive the income and the share that we'll get, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, there's very little that the company's promising here. They're kind of saying that maybe if we get opportunities to share revenue, that they'll show us a contract and if we don't like it, it's our problem. So I push the issues with a bunch of internal notes and with a little bit of drafting to try to get them to to explain what are the obligations we would have. Can you attach a form of the revenue contract? Because this sounds like something they've done for other people. So like, let's hammer out the commercial terms instead of just punting them to, well, maybe you'll send us an agreement at some point. So, you know, that's- And that goes to, the one thing I can say is, you know, we talk about when you're representing a client and your priorities and the client's priorities, most of the time, the client's priorities are money. It's owning, yeah. keeping ownership of what they have and control, and then mm-hmm. it's making money. So right. making sure the money provision work is one of your top priorities. Absolutely. And you can, as, as you know better than anybody probably, you can and should get into the weeds on revenue and how, there's, how it's being shared how it's being accounted and how, whether or not there's an audit right, not in an agreement like this, but in larger agreements where there's more money at stake, whether there's an audit right, all of these things, because, you know, we know how the industry works and, and if there's an opportunity for somebody to, to not pay you, uh, they'll Mm -hmm. probably take that opportunity. (laughs) So we, we, you know, we need to think about those (laughs) things and, and, and you're very right. It's probably one of the top two or three issues in every, in every contract is, when do I get paid? How do I get paid? What do I get paid? Right, right. Let's, let's look at termination quickly. Um, this is, uh, I, sorry, I had to zoom back so much on there because so many of the sections dealt with termination, but I think you can see this if you squint a little bit. Um, the termination sections talk about giving notice of breach. I tried to clean that up in the language to, to the, the three, days biz, three business days notice for breach seemed extremely short. Uh, I tried to make it 15, you could make it 30, but I put things in brackets that I want my clients to, to opine on. Um, and I wanted to make sure it's about breaches that are only breaches that are curable, et cetera, what the notice period is. You can't always rely on the relationship to solve problems. So you need to make sure your termination language is clear, that the notice periods are clear, um, and that the causes for termination are clear. So the causes for termination are were interestingly done here. In 15, the network reserved the right to terminate between day zero and day X, which is the date on which so-and-so episodes of the podcast were were done. That's this grace period. And then after that, Mm -hmm. they can terminate on 30 days for convenience. And it was weird to me. I said, well, why do they... Yeah. Why do they have the right, why do they have a termination for convenience right anyway? I took the most macro view. If we're entering into a relationship with them where we're going to be ramping up resources, engaging in all those agreements on the left side of my diagram, right, to, to ramp up mm-hmm. to make 30 episodes of this podcast, and they can just pull out of the relationship. That doesn't seem fair or market, really. So then if okay. you go to the section, section 16, we have a right to terminate for convenience. But 
it's only after we've produced the minimum episodes. So we're the ones who are locked in mm -hmm. for a minimum number of episodes, which also seems strange. I do understand that, but to have that coupled with a termination for convenience right by the company at pretty much any time, mm -hmm. this doesn't seem fair. So I tried to restructure yeah. things in, in the drafting and the comments so that it's a conversation we can have with the client about, about you know, what do you actually want here? And you'll notice just right. quickly in the third paragraph in 15, I added language saying what happens after termination, not just survival language, but give us our stuff back when it terminates, right? right. Deliver all of our things to us, pay us, all these things that we want to happen on termination. So these are things that wouldn't necessarily be addressed unless we raise them. Yeah, no, so, that's a great, those are all great points. Yeah, I'm just putting up the thank you slide because it's the final slide, but um, if there were questions that you, you think would be interesting? Yeah, we, we received a few questions. So one of the ones I wanted to ask about was, or one of the ones that I thought was really interesting, what is, is particular about a podcast agreement and have seen in other types of technology or copyright related agreements? What's particular about podcast agreements? Okay, so I think what's interesting is that the podcast agreements are very much an amalgam of different types of agreements. We used to see this a lot back in, you know, back when you or I, you and I were in big law and, and the dot com boom was just ending and the bubble was about to burst. <laughs> um, there were different weird kinds of agreements that you'd have to make up from scratch. They're kind of homunculus agreements. Take a part here, part there, put a Frankenstein's monster together, and you've got an agreement that seems mm -hmm. to address this new business relationship. Now, even though podcasts are 20 years old or so, the industry is evolving so much that these agreements are very much combination agreements. There are elements of services. There are elements of, of licensing. There are elements of um, weird different kinds of risk allocation in an industry that is evolving really, really rapidly. And I think that's what makes them different from other kind of straight copyright license agreements is that there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of them are about operational stuff, but around that operational mm -hmm. stuff, there are a lot of interesting risk allocation issues. So I think, it, I think what makes them different is that they're, they're a great, they're, they're not just a license agreement, they're really commercial agreements with a big licensing component. Right, no, that's a great answer. The other, and the last one, because we're almost out of time, is sure. is there a best practice for allocating IP rights? A best, sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, a best, is there a best practice for allocating intellectual property rights? Ah, oh, I see. Well, I think the best practice of course, depends on what side of the equation you're on. As you can see with the network, with the podcast network re agreement that we reviewed, they thought the best practice was to say you own you own the finished episodes, but we own the raw materials podcaster. And which is, I don't think that's the, uh, it's, that's an uncommon view, but I think the best practice for the podcaster is to take the position that we discuss, which is I'm creating this, I own it, I'm paying for it. Um, I own all the things that are going into it and the final episode, but I'm willing to give you as broad of a license as you need podcast network or whoever you are in order to do what, in order to fulfill the commercial relationship. And let's talk about what those rights are. And preferably, I'm going to let you do that non-exclusively, or there'll be a very limited exclusivity for certain purposes so that I can go and get my materials out there and seek the fame and fortune that I've always dreamed of. <laughs> so <laughs> That you deserve, Dave. And that, frankly, as we all know, I very much deserve. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> But that yeah. is great. Thank you so much. I think we reached the end of our hour, and I really appreciate all the hard work you put in to kind of explain this topic and help us all understand it. So thank you so much, Gabe. And well, thank you, everybody who registered. Uh, Law and Collider will be sending out a copy of the recording, so you, if you missed a part of it, uh, you'll be able to see it. Again. Thanks, everybody. Thank, yep. Thank you, Laura, and thanks, Law Insider. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.